Two weeks ago, we had two people, Cesar Vidal and Laura Guerrera, get water baptized. And they went public with their faith. How many of you know when you go public with your faith on water baptism, you're not just supposed to do it when you're water baptized? Jesus said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the ways to let your faith go public is with good works. And so I've been going through six different ways in the Bible that talks about going public with our faith. We're going to finish up six and seven today. And what I'd like you to know is I'm teaching on this so that you will understand that the way God created you is exactly the way he intended to create you so that you could share your faith without having have to feel condemnation because you're not like the Apostle Paul of the Bible. You're not like uh, the Apostle Peter of the Bible or you're not like Pastor Roger or Pastor Pinnell or me. God created you and the one thing he will never change about you is your personality. Now he will add things to your personality. But your personality is exactly the way he created you so that you will reach people with the faith of Christ that no one else will reach. And this series is meant to let you understand that you don't have to pretend to be a Billy Graham. All right? You can be yourself. And God, you might be surprised that God will use you just the way he created you. All right? And so let's turn in our Bibles to a different passage today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 9. And I want to talk about the importance of us going public with our faith. 2 Corinthians 5, and we're going to read a few verses here, starting in verse 9, the New King James. Janelle, if you could find that, thank you. And it says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to Jesus. We want our lives to be pleasing to Jesus. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each and every one of us may receive the things done in this body according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. Now this is talking about Christians. Christians will be rewarded on good and bad. All right? People who are not Christian will not stand before Christ. They will stand before God the Father at the great white throne judgment. But Christians stand before their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. All right? At the judgment seat of Christ. So there's two judgments. One for Christians, one for non-Christians. Christians who do good and evil will be rewarded. They're not going to get kicked out of heaven. All right? Once you're saved, you get into heaven. But what you do with your faith, you will be judged on. All right? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, or the judgment of the Lord, we persuade men who don't know Jesus Christ. But we are well known of God, to God, and I trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves against you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us. That is the motivation of us Christians. Whatever we do with our faith and love, it's because of the love of Christ that compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, that being Jesus, then all died. And Jesus died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. A Christian who thinks life revolves around him does not know Jesus Christ. Jesus was not narcissistic. He did not live for himself. And he wants us to do the same. That we should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore now, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we, are known, we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, remember this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
all the old junk of your past passed away. I mean, no, that's the truth. It doesn't lie. You've got to believe it. it. It's meaningless if you don't believe it. Old things, all the garbage in your past has passed away. Behold, all things have become new in Christ. Amen? Verse 18. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given all of us, every one of us has a ministry of what? What does that mean? No one gets to God the Father because of their sin. So God sent Jesus Christ down to die on the cross to deal with our sin. And because he dealt with our sin, if we receive Christ, there is no barrier between you and the Father because of Christ. You have been reconciled to God. Now don't commit the crime of heaven and keep that ministry of reconciliation secret. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't be self-centered and narcissistic. But you have been committed with a word or a ministry of reconciliation. Next scripture. Now then, we are all ambassadors for Christ. As though God the Father were pleading through you and me. To those who don't know Christ, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen? For he hath made him Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When you, are right, when you receive Christ, you believe that you, your sin has separated you from God, and Christ, through the cross, has reconciled you to God. You now have a righteousness, which means you can walk into God's presence anytime you want. You understand that, right? Nothing keeps you out of the presence of God because of Christ. Now, use that and tell other people it's our sins that keep us away from God. But through Christ, you can be reconciled. You can have a righteousness that God will accept. And it's the righteousness of God in Christ. All right. One other, uh, where are we on five? Go to uh, chapter 6, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. It's worth the wait. Read this with me, please. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What does that mean? For by grace are you saved through faith. You've been saved by grace. You've been reconciled back to God because of Christ for grace. No, don't don't live that in vain. Go public with your faith. Tell other people about Christ in you, the hope of glory, amen? Don't keep it to yourself. You don't have to be a Peter or a Paul. You don't have to be a Roger. You don't have to be a Sister Cindy. You can be yourself. And God wants to use you to let the message and the faith of Christ be hope to others. Amen? Bow your heads with me, please. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you. And Lord, angels work with me today in Jesus' name. You're God's word says that you are ministers of those who are heirs of the grace of life. Help us, help us to grow today in the ministry of reconciliation. That we, Lord God, would know that you have put us on this planet not to be silent, but to go public with our faith. Help us today to learn to be comfortable with our personalities of who we are in Christ. Not to look at the past, but to look at ourselves through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's, let's review a few things. If you have an outline, I'm talking about seven ways you can go public with your faith, all right? So let's go to number one. Seven ways that I see in the Bible that you can go public and share the faith of Christ, okay? The first one is the confrontational approach. 
Remember I talked about this? These are people that are type A personalities. They're very strong. They're very vocal. They're very bold. And uh, sometimes these are the people that sometimes invade our space and we don't always like it. But if you're one of those persons, God made you that way for a reason. Peter, the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, they were... On the day of Pentecost, the church was birthed and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they were just speaking in tongues and some of the people said, oh, they're a bunch of drunks. They've had too much wine in the morning. Peter got up with a confrontational approach. approach, And he said, they are not drunk as you suppose. But they, this is what Joel said, that on the last day God will pour his spirit upon all flesh. And then he preached Christ to them. And he said, and you guys crucified Christ, but God rose him from the dead. And a lot of the people, not everyone listened to him, but 3,000 people said, what should we do? And he said three things. Repent, be water baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. And 3,000 were that day to the church. My mic's going in and out a little bit, Steve, if you could work with that, please. So he was very confrontational, all right? And uh, I asked how many had that approach, and uh, three or four people put their hands up, and I said, that's just the way God made you, and he wants you to stay that way. We need people like that, all right? Then the next approach, let's go to number two, uh, was for the intellectuals. We call it the intellectual approach. And Paul was in Athens where all these uh, Greek philosophers and scholars were debating and talking about all these idols, all these altars to different gods. And Paul walked in there, and he just felt so grieved in his spirit. And uh, go to the next one, the verse, please. And Paul said to all these philosophers, I was passing through, and I even found an altar to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship, the unknown God, without knowing him, I'm going to tell you about him. (laughs) I'm going to proclaim. And then he began to preach Jesus Christ to them. And he said, this Jesus, because the world does not understand the true nature of God the Father, the devil has done a good job of making people think that God the Father is furious with his creation and he's angry with his creation and he can't wait to kill you. He said, God the Father sent down his son so that you would know what the Father is like. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And in him we live and move and have our being. He started preaching Christ to them. And then he said, and one day you're going to stand before this judgment when you are raised from the dead. And they said, oh my goodness, raised? You mean life after death? A resurrection? We've never heard this before. And it said, some believed, some mocked, but they said, come back again. Come back again. We want to hear more about the resurrection. And so this is the intellectual approach of going public with your faith. These are the educated, the people that like facts and logic, and uh, they want to have things lined up, you know, and it's very good for people to grasp this, but the negative side of this is that no one is saved by logic. The gospel of Jesus Christ, though it can be formulated in logic, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God not of works, not of logic, not of facts. No man comes into the Father unless the Spirit draws him. So you still have to pray when you go through the arguments of why Christ really is the Messiah, but I mean, no logic alone won't do it. God, has, they have to have an encounter through the Holy Spirit with Christ, and so we have to pray that, all right? The third way of going public with our faith is what we call the testimony approach. You remember the blind man that Jesus healed? He spit in the mud and he anointed him. And then he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And it was a miracle that a guy who was blind, Jesus healed him. Now he didn't see Jesus. He just knew Jesus was laying his hands in mud on his eyes. And he washed and he could see. And then everyone started saying, this is the blind beggar that was begging for money. And everyone was... The testimony went right around. This guy was blind. Who did this? And the Pharisees said, this is a miracle. And they said, who did this to you? He said, Jesus. He goes, oh, not Jesus. Not that sinner. Are you sure that sinner Jesus healed you? And and the blind man said, you remember what he said? Whether Jesus is a sinner 
I do not know. What I know is I was once blind, and now I see. Before I met Jesus, I was blind. Now I see. This is called the testimony approach. You share your story of what Christ has done in your life. Before Christ, I was a mess. Before Christ, I had a death of a loved one. I went through divorce. I had health issues. Before Christ, I had some terrible things. People did, you know, I went through a Judas experience where someone stabbed me in the back. Before Christ, some terrible things happened. But since I met Christ, let me tell you something. I'm not the same. What's the positive things about a testimony approach? Everybody likes a story. All right? Everyone likes a story. Now, you've got to keep your story short. No one wants to hear an hour and a half story. But everyone likes a story. All right? The negative thing, don't make your story a bragamony. You know what a bragamony is? Bragamony is where people talk about how great of a sinner they were before they came to Christ. And they take the glory of what Christ did in their life off Christ and say, let me tell you what a good sinner I was. Don't make it a bragamony. Make it a testimony pointing to Christ. All right? that's, that's number three. Number four, I talked about this, the interpersonal approach. This is from Levi, whose name is also Matthew. This was a great story. Uh, he was uh, a tax collector with the Roman government. And as all the tax collectors, they overcharged all the people, and the people didn't like them. They were outcasts. And so he got tired of being hated, but he made up with being hated by loving money. And money was a god in his life. The god of mammon is a god of money. He lived for money. He loved money. And Jesus came into him life, and he, he told them that uh, he just said some things to him and got him straight, that the love of money is the root of all evil. And you're not going to be happy if you just live for money. You're not going to be happy. And so this touched Levi's heart. And he said, you know what? I believe you're speaking the truth. I tried to live for money and there's emptiness in me. There's no joy in me. And yet Christ brought him joy. So what does he do? Let's go to the next scripture. He decides to get all his, all his tax collector friends. He's known them for 15, 20 years. Interpersonal approach. You've known these people for a long time. They trust you. They may not know Christ, but they trust you. And so Levi takes what he used to worship, money, and he gave not a feast. He gave a what? A great feast. He invested his money into his sinning friends so they would hear Jesus Christ. Levi gave Jesus a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. And so he gets up and he says, you know what, I used to worship money. By the way, in the New Testament, there are only two roots that the Bible warns you of that will take your soul to hell. Beware of them. Only two roots that if they get into your heart and they become a root, you're not going to make it to heaven. The first root, for the love of money is the root of all evil by which some in the church have coveted after and have erred from their faith. You know what the other root is? The root of bitterness. Refusal to forgive. The root of bitterness and the root of the love of money, the two dangers that destroy people's faith. Jesus said, if you don't forgive them, my Father in heaven will not what? Beware of the roots. There's only two of them. Don't let them in your heart. <laughs> All right? So Levi had it in his heart, and he's there, and he says, listen, I brought you all here. I've got this great feast, and I, I invited all my friends, all these tax collectors. I want to tell you something. I don't charge 20 to 30% over the tax rate in the Roman government anymore like I used to. And they what? How do you make money? You know, what's going on? He said, let me tell you something. I met this guy, Jesus, and I invited him to the feast today. And uh, he's going to stand up and he's going to tell you what he told me. And I pray that you listen to what he said. Money is not the primary goal of life. Jesus is. And he says, okay, Jesus, stand up, please, and tell all my tax friends what you told me. 
How did he get that approach? Because he knew them for 15, 20 years. Do you think they all repented? No. Some kept living for money, but some of them did. Some of them did. So this is the type of person who, they're not ready to tell you what Christ did in their life, but they'll bring you to church and ask someone else, the pastor or someone else, tell them about Jesus, tell them the gospel. Matthew was a baby Christian. He didn't know what to do. So he invested his money in a big party, had people over, and said, now listen to Jesus. Is that your approach? How many good at giving parties? <laughs> you make sure when you're at the party, someone can clearly explain who Jesus Christ is. That's important, all right? So that's the interpersonal approach, all right? Let's go on to the next one. This is the last one we'll review, and then we'll get into the lesson. Dorcas. The Dorcas service approach. Another name for Dorcas was Tabitha. And Dorcas was a woman who had the gift of helps. The gift of helps is uh, someone in the church who does a lot of things for the church behind the scenes. They're not comfortable out in public. They don't want the limelight. They'll do anything and everything for you behind the scenes. And that's how churches are built on people with the gift of helps. All right. Some people in church, they say, look at me. You got to look at me. I got to tell you what I did for Jesus. Look at me. Not people with gifts of helps. They just say, tell me what you need. I'll do it. This was Dorcas. Dorcas had parties. She made food. She did quilts. She gave blankets. She took care of the poor. And then Dorcas died. And the church was like, oh my goodness, she's dead. We can't, we can't replace. We, we can't put four or five people to replace her. Well, Peter's in the next town. Go get him. Peter will raise him from the dead. Now this is interesting. This church with Dorcas, they knew she could be raised from the dead, but they knew none of them could do it. They knew who had the working of miracles. Do you know where to go when you need help? Do you know who has the gifts in the church that you need? They went and got Peter and said, Peter, come here, raise her from the dead. And Peter had a track record of the working of miracles, raising her from the dead, and he did. And many people heard about it, and many people got saved. Isn't that wonderful when you hear these miracles? How many know when someone's on their deathbed, as much as I love speaking in tongues, they don't need someone to speak tongues over them? They need someone with the working of miracles. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> when someone is sick, they don't need a prophecy. They need someone with the gifts of healing. You with me? You need to know who has the gifts and you go after them. And if you're frustrated with not knowing who has the gifts, you need to ask for some gifts. Ask and it will be given to you. All right? They knew who to go get. And this Dorcas is a very popular ministry in this church. I said there's a lot of women, a lot of people in this church that go public with their faith by their gifts of service. They do so much for people. They do it for the saints and they do it for people that don't know Jesus. All right? So the wonderful thing about the Dorcas ministry service approach is that people know you can't do that unless there's some type of kindness and love in your heart that just isn't normal. Jesus has got to be there. The negative thing about it is don't use your ministry and keep your mouth shut. Open your mouth and tell them why you're doing what you're doing, why you're cleaning the house, why you're making the meals, why you're taking care of the poor. This is where you say, I'm blessed to be a blessing. And Jesus Christ has blessed me that I might bless you. Would you like to hear about the blessing of Christ in my life? And after you've served them, you have a way to go public with your faith. You with me? All right. So that's the f uh, five of them. Let's get into the last two today because one or more of these will fit you. One or more of these will fit you, all right? The sixth way to go public with your faith is what I call the invitation approach. How many remember the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4? These are people that they're not good at speaking. They're not good at sharing the gospel of Christ. They're not good at telling people how to be reconciled to God. They're just, they're just, very, they're just very insecure about speaking. But they're good about inviting people to church. They're good about inviting people to the couples group. 
They're good about inviting people to a series on the family, and they know their family's falling about. You know, the church is doing a series on the family next month. I know you've been having some struggles. Come to my church. That's what these invitation people are good at. All right? So let me quickly tell you the story. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's going through Samaria, Samaria because... The Holy Spirit wanted him to have a divine encounter with a very sexual, immoral woman. She was such an immoral woman that the reputation through all of Samaria was known about her, and she was always sneered. So when she would go to the town well, she wouldn't go when everyone was there so she'd be criticized for her loose living. She would go when it was the hot heat of the day. No one would be there, and no one would bother her. You with me? So she goes in the heat of the day, probably 1, 1 o'clock, 1 1.30. It's the hottest part of the day. And the disciples come. They, they see Jesus. They say, we're going to go in the town and get some lunch. We'll leave you here, and we'll leave you by the well so you can get a drink. So he's there. She's there. She's drawing water. And you know the story. In John 4, he says, could you draw me a glass of water or a little cup of water? Now, what you don't know is that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. It's called Racism. And the Samaritans were the Jews that compromised the word of God and married unbelievers. They knew better than God. They knew better than their parents. So they married non-believers and they mixed the breed of pure Judaism and they were used by Satan to try to hinder the coming Messiah. Because the Messiah would only come from a pure Jew. Are you with me? That's why Jesus said you don't do that. So, it was, how many have seen the Hatfields and the McCoys? That's, that's the Hatfields and the McCoys. So Jesus says to her while she's drawing water, hey, could you give me some water? And she's like, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We're not supposed to even talk with each other. Let alone Jewish men don't talk to women. Jewish men not only don't talk to Jewish or Gentile women, they don't even talk to Jewish women. You're not supposed to talk to them. All right? Talking about the conservative, ascetic type. So Jesus is talking. Why are you asking me for water? He says, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, I would give you water, living water. And she goes, oh, living water. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Kind of went over her head. Then I don't have to come get water every day. You could give me living water. And Jesus goes, no, 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 honey, you're not getting it. But I'll keep talking to you. How many know sometimes you can talk over people's heads? Don't stop. All right? You keep sharing your faith. I would like this living water. Jesus said, okay, okay. Go get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. And then God gives Jesus through the Holy Spirit a word of knowledge. That's right. You've had five husbands. And the one that you're living with now, he's not your husband either. And she goes, you're a prophet. Imagine that, huh? (laughs) She says, well, let's change the topic about my immoral living. You're a prophet. He says, yeah, yeah. Well, let's change the topic. You Jews say you're supposed to worship in the mountain in Jerusalem. We say we worship here. And Jesus says, listen, let's let's stop talking semantics. The hour is coming and now is that the Father is seeking true worshipers. For God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Too many people come to worship God in spirit. But they don't do it in truth when they're living with someone, even though the Bible says you're not to do that. So he dealt directly with their sin. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. You can't worship God Coming to church and jumping all around, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't live in truth. God wants you to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Oh, I don't know if I could tell someone about their sin, Pastor. They might get offended. Jesus did. Jesus did. And she appreciated that. She appreciated that. Let's go to the verse. This is what she did. Go to the next verse. And then the woman left. 
And she went her way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Did Jesus tell her everything she ever did? That's okay. A little bit of zeal. Don't, just because some new Christian gets a little zeal, don't, don't throw water on them. All right? Don't put out the fire. Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and they came to him. Next, next verse, please. And because of her invitation approach of inviting people to Christ, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman. What did she do? She invited people to Christ. You invite people to the church. You invite people to the small group. You invite people to the Holy Supper that Sunday. You invite people to a special pastoral series. You invite people. That's it. And they urged Jesus to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And what happened? And many more believed. Why? Because a sexual immoral woman had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He said, you can't serve me just in the invisible spirit. You've got to serve me visibly. You can't keep it secret to yourself. You've got to let your lifestyle show people in truth. And she didn't get offended. She went back. She told people, and many people got saved. Isn't that wonderful? Invitation. He said, well, I, I can't share the gospel. I, 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 I'm not confident enough to share my testimony. Well, can you invite someone to church? You don't have to be pigeonholed into you must do it this way or it's no good. No, you have to find which one is good for you. Now, what's the strength of this approach? It doesn't require a lot of facts. It just requires a little courage to say, hey, why don't you come to our church? Our church, you know what? You'll be fed spiritually. We feel the God's presence in our church. You come through the front door. You'll have some greeters. They'll love you right away. There's a nice spirit of love in our church. Come to our church. That's it. The weakness is you got to move from invitation to sharing what Christ means to you. Right? you got to work on that. But anyone can invite them. Amen? And then I conclude with number seven. This one is not in the Bible, but if you like church history, it's all through church history. The Eastern Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church, the three branches of Christianity. The church history approach is people who use their creative gifts to share their faith publicly. These are the musicians. Aren't you glad for the musicians we have in our church? That every Sunday they come up here and they publicly share their faith? These are artists. These are people, we don't have much drama in this church, but some churches they have a drama uh, these are people who do dance. And you ever been to churches and they've done a beautiful dance in the Lord? It's an artistic, cultural way. I've been in a lot of churches, you know, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, then others are um, sports. Don't you love it when people use their athletic abilities and they, they win the Stanley Cup or the, um, you know, the baseball championship, NBA championship, whatever it is, and don't you love it when they don't say, I thank God, but they say, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I like those that aren't afraid to name the name of our God. It's called Jesus Christ. That's his primary name. All right. I love it. And they use it. They're not afraid of saying that. Go to the next scripture. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whether you work, do sports, paint, take photographs, whatever you play music, you know, music, whatever you do in life, all right, your job, your cleaning of your house, doing the dishes after a nice feast, you do it all for what? Glory of God. Don't forget it. Everything you do, you do for God. You do it for God. Now, let me give you a couple examples of this. Anyone like Bach? Ode of Joy? He's been dead for centuries, and that music is still releasing the faith of Christ in his life. It blesses me. How about Handel's Messiah? Anyone ever heard of Handel's Messiah? 
Every Christmas it's played somewhere. Guy's been dead for hundreds of years. And his faith is still culturally relevant. His faith comes through. And a lot of people still get saved from that. They give altar calls at these Christmas programs. Anyone ever seen my favorite picture of the prodigal? The prodigal son by Rembrandt. Anyone ever heard of Rembrandt? You should read his life story and why he... If you come to my house... Over my fireplace, there's a contemporary picture of the prodigal coming home, falling into his father's arms. It's amazing. Now, many of you are immigrants from Europe, and you've seen people go public with their faith with the beauty of some amazing creations of cathedrals. <laughs> I love cathedrals. Uh, I had the chance, when my dad was pastoring in Rensselaer, New York, I went into one of the biggest Catholic churches downtown Albany, the, the state capital of New York, and they were doing renovations, and they, the workers let me come in and see it. It was beautiful. I just love it. I love it. I, I of course, you've probably been down to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Gorgeous. One that really blessed me in the last year was I went downtown Waterbury, I don't know the name of it, but it's the big Catholic one with these huge marble pillars. It was gorgeous. Someone told me they almost shut it down. Someone built these things with an artistic ability for the glory of Christ. How many are with me? I have a missionary friend, uh, Steve and his wife, they, they're in Uruguay, and he went down there at a very young age in his 20s. And what he would do is he'd go to these villages and he would play soccer two, three times a week. And all the kids would come out because in South America, soccer is huge. And then when he would teach them about soccer because he almost went professional, then he would start teaching them about Jesus Christ. Using your athletic abilities for Christ. You with me? In one of my former churches, there was a... He, he was a town drunk. And uh, his mother was a man-hater. Anyone know a woman who's a man-hater? How many remember Hall & Oates, that song, She's a Man-Eater? There's some out there. You young men, you stay away from them. They chew you up. The town drunk, his mother was a man-hater. She was abused by men. And she had him out of wedlock and took out all her fury on her son. So sad. One day, he showed up at our church parsonage with a handgun to kill himself. And I was at the church at a board meeting, and my wife had little Polly and a little three-month-old baby in her hand talking to a guy with a gun saying, I'm going to kill myself. But the angel of the Lord encamps around them that fear him. So we helped this guy. We would talk him down, talk him out of suicide, talk him out of... He's going to shoot himself. He's going to shoot his mom. And, and uh, one day he came to us and he says, you know what? He says, you know, Pastor, you and the church, you've been really kind to me. And I know I've caused you a lot of stress. I'd like to do something for the church. Now, he doesn't know Christ. He's, he's not saved. I said, what do you want to do? He says, I want to paint a mural. I said, you can paint? He says, I'm an artist. I went to school. I said, you went to school for them. You never know until you talk to them. He says, yeah, you go get me this and this and this paint, and I'm going to paint something in Sunday school. You know what he did? Took three weeks, and he painted a mural of Noah's Ark. I couldn't believe it. It was one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen in my life. Now, I could have shut him down and said, no, 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 you're the town drunk. Go out here. It's beautiful. Just beautiful. He did... He, he doesn't qualify from number one to six approaches he's only number seven and he says i can only do something with my gift would you let me do it i've been to churches uh bigger churches where they will have a stage over here for drama and they'll have the musicians here and uh, they will have artistic tribe um pods over here and other things um easels where they will have artists come up and during the worship they will start painting 
when the anointing of God falls, they'll start painting pictures. Have you ever been to churches like that? It's beautiful. And then they sell the beautiful, these are artists, all right? They will sell the art pictures and then they'll give some of the proceeds to the church. It's just beautiful. The point is, you don't have to be pigeonholed a certain way to express your faith. You can take pictures, you can paint paintings, you can use your athletic abilities, you can sculpture and shape and make the church look beautiful. This is, how many believe this is a beautiful church? Some great work, some hard work has gone into this. And though it's not in the book of Acts, it's something that people have used and you can use it. And I pray that you will. So let's wrap this up. Which one of these approaches stirs your heart? Confrontational, intellectual, which one? Testimonial, interpersonal, the Dorcas, which one? You need to know which one it is, and then the second thing you need to do is know, you know, I don't have to be Pastor Paul, I don't have to be Sister Cindy, I don't have to be my mother or my father, I can just be myself to express my faith. That's the whole point of this series. You just have to be yourself, and God has given you friends that you can share the faith. What if they reject me? You've done You leave the response of how people respond to you shared with the Holy Spirit. One of the things I would encourage you in your daily devotions when you read the Bible and pray, you should always say, Lord, would you bring someone across my path this week that I could just somehow influence them with my faith? Might be at work, might be in the neighborhood, might be at Walmart, big Y. And then you just start a spiritual conversation. Are you into spiritual spirituality? Are you in the spiritual things? What do you think of what's going on over in the Middle East? You ever think they'll have peace over there? Let's talk about that. Then you talk about the Prince of Peace and you bring it in. What's your church background? How did you grow? Are you still practicing? No, I'm a non-practicing this. I'm a non-practicing that. Oh, you know what? I can see how that can happen. You know, uh, I went through a season of that, but now I'm a practicing Christian. And let me tell you what God's doing in my life. I don't want to talk about that right now. I mean, no, that's a sign. Okay, they're not ready. But you've done your part. You've shared a little bit of your faith. And then you let God take care of how the people respond. Amen? There's a good book called Becoming a Contagious Christian by Mark Middleberg. And I close with this. Sanctify the Lord. And I'll answer, my mic's cutting in and out. Always be ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that is in you. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give an answer. All right? Be ready. And know that God has given you a ministry of reconciliation to bring people to Christ. Not to make you feel bad, but because He knows, he knows exactly the way He created you is exactly all that you need to open your mouth and to share your faith. You don't have to be someone else. And how many wish you had a little bit more courage to open your mouth, a little bit more boldness to share your faith? Raise your hand. Pray for that today, amen? Amen. Stand up with me, please. Lord, we thank you that you have given to every one of us, according to your word, the ministry of reconciliation, where we can go public with our faith to share what Christ has done in our life. I pray, Lord, this week that as you have seen the many hands raised, Lord, that you would help us your spirit would give us a little bit more boldness, a little bit more courage, and to be discerning, Lord God, of people that are actually giving us signs they need to talk about something. And we could open that up 
to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the only one that brings us life. Lord, during this COVID-19, we still have a lot of people that have not returned to our church, Lord. Some for legitimate reasons, some, Lord, because they're just fearful. I pray, Lord God, that you would bring them back. I pray, Lord God, I thank you that you have continued to protect the people of this church from COVID-19, even those that may have gotten it, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that they've come through it. We lift up our president, President Trump, Lord God, we pray that you would bring him through it. And those in his cabinet, and Lord, those that are senators, both Democrat and Republican, and those that are in the House, both Democrat and Republican, bring them through it, Lord God. We pray, Father, that what was meant for evil with this COVID-19, Lord, you would use it for good for the church of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we give you permission Use us to open our mouths, not to fight, not to debate, but, Lord, to point people to faith in Jesus Christ. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.